All right, Mother's Day, Mother's Day. Welcome home, welcome home. Glad you're here to worship with us. So glad you're here to worship with us today. If it's your first time with us or if you've never completed the Connect card or if uh, some information has changed, would you take that Connect card that you were handed on the way in and would you begin to fill it out? Uh, you can wait until the end. The offering plates are going to come by. If you're a guest today, you can put those in offering plates. Uh, and then if you're a guest today, you can hold on to that card and connect with someone at our Next Steps area. We have a gift for you if you're a first-time guest today. I want to say a big thank, thank you to, to, to Nancy Monarch Photography uh, for taking all those beautiful pictures today. And um, I would just say this. Uh, don't, don't worry. Uh, the pictures will come. And so, like, tomorrow, don't start emailing uh, Tiffany in the office. Where are my pictures? Uh, it takes, uh, give, us, give us a few days. Give us a few days, okay? And so, appreciate that and so appreciative because it's warm out there, right? I mean, I'm not the only one. It's warm. Summer. Summer's here. Hope you're ready. Hope you're ready. Uh, but also on that Connect card, I would say there is a prayer request area. There's an area that we want to encourage you to write down how we can pray for you we want to come alongside of you specifically. It's an honor. It's a privilege to come alongside of you and pray. And so would you, uh, would you take that connect card and would you complete it for us? Matthew chapter 6. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to dig into the Word of God today. I hope you're ready. Every time we gather, we're going to dig into the Word of God or I don't know what we're doing. So we're going to dig into the Word of God today. Matthew chapter 6. We're in this teaching series. If you haven't noticed, uh, it's titled Best Sermon Ever. And, uh, and, and as I'm going to say every week, most likely, it's not because I'm preaching it. Uh, it's because Jesus first preached it. Matthew chapter 6. It's the Sermon on the Mount. Begins in chapter 5, ends in chapter 7. And so Jesus has much to say, much uh, in, to instruct uh, his disciples as they've gathered around. He's just called them from the Sea of Galilee. These are fishermen that he's called to go and not just fish for fish anymore, but but to switch careers, if you will. To, to, there's a new calling on their lives to fish for people. And so he's instructing these disciples in the way of the kingdom. What, is it, what does it look like to live in the kingdom? And so chapter 6, what we come across are the how-tos. And it's the how-tos. How to give, how to pray. How to forgive, how to fast. We're going to cover it all today. Hope you're ready. Matthew chapter 6. It's the how-tos that Jesus teaches on how to live out righteousness, how to be like Jesus, how to live in the kingdom. I mean, if you're with us last week, we closed the message with verse 48. Chapter 5, verse 48, if you have your Bibles. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And we read a scripture like that, and it's like, no way. How could I ever do that? Not me. I mean, you don't know me, you know, uh, whatever the thoughts are. And it's true. Apart from Christ in you taking steps each day of growth in him, the goal of this Christian life is to become like Christ. And how do we do that? Taking one step each day, becoming more and more like him. And so the main idea today and what we're gonna what we're gonna see again and again on these how tos is that Jesus teaches us a better way to live. As we talk about consider kingdom living, Jesus teaches us a better way to live. Look to verse one, chapter six, Matthew. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father in heaven. So whenever you give to the poor, don't sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be applauded by people. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. Verse 3, but when you give to the poor, when you give to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And so the first how-to. Jesus teaches us how to give. He says, verse 1, chapter 6, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others, to be seen by them. Do you see that? To be seen by them. Jesus tells us not to do righteous things to be seen. 
Don't do these righteous things. Don't do these good things. The word righteous translated charitable giving. Don't, don't do these kinds of things to be seen by others or to be seen by the world. We are not to live out righteousness for the world to see how good we are or how gracious we are, but to see how good and gracious Jesus is and that there is no other way into salvation but through Christ Jesus and Christ Jesus alone. Amen? Now, you might be thinking, if you've been with us from the beginning of the series, Pastor Mike kicked off this teaching series, chapter 5, talked about the salt and light, salt and light. And you might be thinking there's a contradiction. There's a contradiction to this command in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, to let your light shine before others. That's what Jesus instructed us, to let our light shine before others. And I would say, in no way, shape, or form is there a contradiction, the, the Word of God does not contradict itself, cannot contradict itself. What Jesus is getting after and what we've discussed the past two weeks is it's all about our heart. It's the intentions and motives of our, of our heart. Why do we do what we do? Ask that question to yourself. Maybe, maybe write it down where you can come back next week. Why am I doing what I'm doing? Why do I do what I, I do? Jesus responds. Jesus responds in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. This is what he says. It's that others may see your good works and glorify God and give glory to God. So why do we do what we do? It's that a lost and dying world might see the living God in us and through us. Verse 2, so whenever you give to the poor, don't sound a trumpet. Don't sound a trumpet before you as the sin as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be applauded by, by, by people. Uh, Jesus says, in other words, don't make a public spectacle of your works. Uh, how, how many times we, we'll sign up to do something if it's out front and center where people can see, right? Because it, it feels so good. It feels so good when somebody comes up and says, you know, attaboy, you know, the attaboys. It feels good. It feels good. And, and so before we know, we, we do what we do only for the attaboys, the applause of man rather than the applause of God. And so Jesus challenges our hearts here and our motives and our intentions behind every action. Why do we do what we do? At the end of the day, church, it is for the glory of God and his glory alone. Jesus says, don't do this as, as a public spectacle. Now, we've been talking about Love Week for a few weeks now. Uh, next Sunday, we kick off Love Week, and I... I hope and I pray that you will participate. If you call Discovery Home, that you will participate with at least one serve project. It's the one week a year that we don't uh, ask, will you? It's really the ask is a bold ask, and it's when, when will you? <laughs> and so uh, which project fits your schedule? Or, or even as Pastor Rowley said last week, uh, maybe take a day off to be a blessing to, to others based out of the right heart. And so as we serve others, it's, uh, it would be easy. It would be easy for you and I to say, wow, look, look, look at what I've done. Man, look how good I am. I cleaned this food pantry. I stocked it. So for these hungry people to come on in and receive some food, look at how good I am. And I would say without question, that would certainly not be with the right heart or the right intention for God to get glory. You're going to be praised and you're looking for some trumpet to blast. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. And so what I love about Love Week is we come under the banner of Jesus Christ and Jesus alone as the church. It's not about one individual other than the, the person of Jesus. And so uh, bear with me for my promotional uh, uh, slot, time slot here uh, at the end of this worship gathering. Kenny and Leanne are going to be in the back and they're going to sign people up to serve in Love Week that starts next Sunday. In fact, uh, one of the easier projects to participate would be right here next Sunday after this 1030 worship gathering. We're going to have assembly lines. We're going to be putting together gospel presentations, partnering with one more child. These gospel presentations are going to uh, be shipped out throughout the world so that kids that you most likely and I most likely will never meet face to face, but they would encounter Jesus that through these gospel presentations, they will know that they are loved by Creator God. And Creator God sent 
Jesus, Jesus came to this earth, died on a cross, was placed in a grave, and he rose victorious so that they might be saved and forgiven of all their sins and have a hope of heaven. And so that's what we're going to do next week. And you say, well, that's just, you know, it's, it's I want to be more out front. Well, there's opportunities for that, but then I would also follow up again. Why are you doing what you're doing? Is it for the Lord Jesus and for his glory alone? If no one ever said good job, no one ever patted you on the back, would you still uh, sign up and would your yes be yes? Uh, so enough about that. Jesus, back to the text, refers to the religious leaders of the day as, the, as hypocrites. Now, the first time I came across the, the true translation and meaning, and it really came alive for me, was about four years ago. I was touring the Holy Land. Uh, one more promotion if you want to tour the Holy Land with me in January 2020. 25, uh, see me for inf more information. But, but, but I was there. I was in Caesarea Maritime. It's on the Mediterranean Sea. It's a beautiful site. King Herod built this incredible palace. I mean, he built stuff. He built, he built, it was all about him. It was about his ego. And that's why he built it, by the way. And so we're, 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 we're there. We're in Caesarea Maritime on the sea, on the Mediterranean Sea. And we go to this theater and a tour guide, he begins to uh, tell us who would take the stage. And the Greeks referred to the actors or stage players as the hypocrites. And I said, whoa. How many times we talk about hypocrites? How many times have you been identified as a hypocrite or I've been identified as a hypocrite or someone that you're inviting to into the church says, I'm not going because of the hypocrites. You know, we use this word over and over again. Don't be like the hypocrites. Jesus says throughout the gospels. And so it came alive to me that day that those who take the stage and put on this mask, those are the hypocrites. And it's interesting, that was a first century uh, theater, by the way, that Herod the Great built. And, and Jesus would have, would have uh, walked the land at that period. And so Jesus is now referring to the religious leaders of the day as what? Hypocrites. And he says, don't be, don't, don't be like the hypocrites. If you're going to give, it better be in a secret, it better be in a quiet for the Lord God to see and not for the world to see. If you seek the applause of man, you will not get the reward of God. And I don't know about you, but the rewards of God are lasting and the applause of man are so short-lived. So each day, each opportunity, we have a decision to make. And I pray that you would make the right one, the God-honoring one, to do what you have been called to do for the glory, for the glory of, of God. He says in verse 4, that your giving may be in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. He says to give in secret, to give quietly and so what does this mean? It simply means this is the way of Jesus. This is the way of Jesus. This is the true test of faith and sacrifice. Why am I giving? Why am I giving? Is it for the Lord to be honored and his kingdom advance? Or is it for me to be praised? Jesus says, do it quietly. Charles Spurgeon once said, keep the thing so secret that even you yourself are hardly aware that you are doing anything at all praiseworthy. Let God be present and you will have enough of an audience. So good. So that's how to give. Next, how to pray. How to pray. Look at verse five. Whenever you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. We see that again. Again, he refers to it. Jesus refers to it. Don't be like the actors. Don't be like the, the, the stage players. Because they love to pray. Standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by people. Do you see this? Don't, 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 don't be like them. They're doing it to be seen by people. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. Verse 6. But when you pray, go into your private room, shut your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. 
Verse 7, when you pray, don't babble like the Gentiles. Some of y'all like praise God because some of y'all are like few of words, right? And, uh, praise God doesn't have to be any kind of length right here. He says, don't babble. Don't babble like these people. Since they imagine they'll be heard by their many words. Don't be like them because your father knows the things you need before you ask him. And so how to pray? We, we see in the text, there's some wrong kind of examples of how to pray. And then there's some right kind of examples of how to pray. And we see the wrong and clearly standing in, in, in public for the world to see. For the world to see. And then we see go, go into private, in secret. And we see in verse 7, when you pray, don't babble like the Gentiles. Let's, let's unpack that a little bit further. Uh, Rabbi Levi said, whoever is long in prayer is heard. Another saying has it, whenever the righteous make their prayer long, that prayer is heard. And so Jesus is, is going against the culture of the day. He's going against the cultural norm of the day. He's going up against the religious leaders of the day and of Judaism who would say the longer you pray, the more holier you are. The longer you pray, the more God hears you. And Jesus says, don't babble on in that kind of a way, in that kind of a light. See, one can pray long prayers, but to the wrong God. We see this in 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah's the only prophet left. He's the only prophet left. The prophet of God, the man of God, the, the messenger of God to call the people of God back to God. He's the only one remaining and they're going to settle a debate of who is the real God. And so he calls the prophets of Baal. There's 450. Go home and read the, the entire text, 1 Kings 18. And he calls the prophets of Baal, 450, 400 prophets of Asherah. And he calls them to the top of Mount Carmel. Looks over the Jezreel Valley. It's a, it's a beautiful sight to take in. And I just imagine that day, Elijah was so... Uh, Committed to the Lord, his God knew that his God was going to come through. And he said, you guys go first because <laughs> I know what my God is going to do. And so the text tells us in 1 Kings 18, all night long, these prophets start dancing and shouting and babbling and raving and cutting themselves. Blood's flying everywhere. They're they're trying all these sacrifices, all these attempts to get through to their false God. And by the next day, there hasn't been one word. There hasn't been one response. And so Elijah takes over, forms the altar, pours water over it, again water over it, again water over it, soaking this altar. And what does he do? He kneels down and doesn't pray this long prayer. And the Lord strikes that altar. The Lord showed up that day. Clark says the true God isn't impressed by the length or eloquence of, of our prayers, but, but the heart. And that's what Jesus was getting after here. The religious leaders of the day were all about the external, the loudest voice on the street corners. And Jesus said, no, it's all about the heart. Prayer requires more of the heart than of the tongue. And, and it's a sad day when, when many don't pray as often as they should because they think I, I, it's got to be more eloquent. No one wants to listen to me. Well, first of all, you can be assured with confidence that the Lord, your God, longs to fellowship with you. He longs to, to hear from you. Uh, the word of God says the prayer of a righteous person avails much. God longs for you to come and spend time with him. I tell you, some of the most beautiful moments of worship through prayer have been not here. They've been in the quietness of my shower <laughs> or, or the, <laughs> the quietness of my 
toilet bowl room uh, or the quietness of my car. No technology, just me and the Lord. Those have been some of the most beautiful moments of, of encountering the Lord, my God, in all his glory. And I want to encourage you. This idea that you got to have it all written out, you got to have it all worded out, you got to be all eloquent. Now, God just wants your heart. He wants to spend time with you. That's how to pray. Well, that's how not to pray. Now, let's go to how to pray <laughs> the Lord's Prayer. It's the model prayer. Verse 9, therefore, you should pray like this. Our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, I recognize many of us memorize uh, that good old King James version, and you had to recite it over and over. Anybody, anybody memorize that? And, and, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand for the next question because the next question is, do you even know what you were saying on the next? <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like we, we just, we're just memorizing something because somebody told me to. I was going to get beat, you know? And so I, I'm just going gonna, just gonna to do it. But what, is it, what does it really mean? And, and so what Jesus is, he's teaching his disciples how to pray. Here's the, the right way to, to pray. And what we find in this model prayer is this. We find three, three petitions of God-centered worship. Three points of God-centered worship. We, we, we find three petitions of human-centered needs. And it's in that order. It's who God is, and then it's here are my needs. Now let's look. Our Father in heaven, Jesus teaches his disciples, start there. Our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Why do we start there? Because we need to acknowledge who God is. Oftentimes, uh, oftentimes the, the struggle is real. And, and oftentimes we just, we, 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 we come to God and we just lay it all out there, right? We just lay it. This is what I need. God show up right now. And we forget who he is. And what he's capable of. And I want to encourage you. Jesus taught the disciples. And he's teaching us to pray this way. Acknowledge who God is. I believe the church has, has lost a reverence of who God is. His name is to be honored as holy. What does that mean? He's set apart. There's no one like him. No one comes close to him. But yet we've reduced God down to, to, to my best friend. No. He's the creator of all things. Who loved the world enough that he would give up his one and only son. And Jesus would walk this earth for 33 years. And the last three he would en endure pain and suffering. In those final hours he would be crucified on a cross. We've lost the reverence of who God is. And how great and how glorious and how majestic. And he is worthy to be praised beyond the one hour on a Sunday. But our lives. He's demanding our lives. And so we look at this prayer and we need to acknowledge who God is. Prayer reminds me of who God is. Well before I bring my needs to him. I need to acknowledge who he is, be remembered that all things are possible, that he is the God of unlimited resources. Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas, Paul and Silas, uh, I shared, a, uh, brought, brought the word to Recovery Church on Monday night. I'm, I'm thankful for Pastor Lyle and Darlin doing an awesome work, Wade and Angie come alongside of them and, and, and many of you. But Monday nights, 5.30 right here for dinner, 6.15 for worship. And I would encourage you, whatever you're struggling with, get here. And you, you feel lonely, you need community, you're, there's an addiction that going on in your life and, and, and you're trying to keep it secret and thinking that's the way. No, get here, get here. And so I shared, I shared a, a message on what do we do when we want to panic? What do we do? How do we respond when we want to panic? And, and, and so I, I, I took us to Philippians 4, but then... There was one verse in Acts chapter 16. Paul and Silas have been preaching the gospel in Philippi. They've been preaching this gospel in Philippi. And, 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 um, and they've been taken. And they've been beaten. And they've been flogged and thrown in prison. 
And I, I don't know about you, but um, I, I think I'd be sitting in a corner somewhere crying about now. <laughs> but not these men. This is, what they, this is what they said. The scripture says, but about midnight. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. What a response. They'd just been beat. They'd just been thrown in prison. It's not looking good in case you like, can't read through the lines here, you know? And this is their response. They're praying and singing. We've lost a, a reverence of who God is, and I would call us back to who God is. L look next at verse 10. Look next at verse 10. Your kingdom come, your will be done. What's Jesus teaching us? He's teaching us this, that it's the Lord's kingdom first. Hey, not your kingdom. Stop building your brand. Stop building your name. This week I've heard several times over, we got too many people trying to be famous when we, when we need to be faithful. We got too many people trying to strive for fame rather than strive to be faithful. In the church of Jesus, we need to be faithful because there's only one who deserves to be famous. And he already is, by the way. His name is Jesus. And so let's just be faithful. Let's just be faithful. His kingdom, his kingdom come. His will be done. Oftentimes when we come to God in prayer, it's God, here's my plans. Just make it work. Listen, God is not a genie in the bottle. He is the living God over all things. And you and I, the moment we get honest about ourselves, we realize we're not as smart as we think we are. But there's one who is, and he's over all things, and we desperately need him. And so Jesus teaches the disciples, pray his will, his will, God. E even if this thing hurts, and most likely if you're going to make some progress in this life, it's going to come only through pain. So endure it, embrace it, trust him, his will, acknowledge his will. Then, then look at verse 11. Give us today our daily bread. Give us today our daily bread. Acknowledge his provision Acknowledge his provision. The, the prayer is for our needs. Listen, church, the prayer here is for our needs, not our greeds. Oftentimes, God, I want this. Here it is. I saw it on Instagram. I want this. And, and uh, but w what would it look like to thank God for the bread that is before us? Uh, in our house for the meat that is before us, you know? Thank, thank you, God, for how you supply for all our needs according to your riches. And so acknowledge his provision as you come to him through prayer. Acknowledge his pr provision. Then, then look at this. Acknowledge his forgiveness. Acknowledge his forgiveness and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Forgive us our, our debts. Acknowledge his forgiveness. Oftentimes we forget that we were the wretched sinner. I was the wretched sinner that has been forgiven and made whole because of the righteousness of Jesus. And so as we pray, thank you, God, for your salvation. Thank you, God, for forgiving all my sins. And here's what it does. The lies that are coming from the enemy, as we pray and acknowledge his forgiveness, the focus shifts from the sin the sinful state to the Savior. And that's when everything changes, when our eyes are fixed on Jesus. Look at the last verse 13. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Lastly, Jesus teaches us how to pray, how to acknowledge his deliverance, acknowledge his deliverance. It, God, if you don't come through I'm in trouble. Oftentimes we try to break through this thing. We try to break through it. And listen, here's what we really need. A humility to bow down before holy God and acknowledge 
his deliverance. God has promised to deliver us from any temptation that is greater, that is greater than what we can handle. He's promised. Promise is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Would you write that reference down? 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has come upon you except what is common to humanity, but God is faithful. Do you see this? God is faithful. Some of you struggle with some stuff, real stuff right now. You know, like how, how, how do I break through it? How do I, will you rely on the, the living God? <laughs> will you rely that he's made a way? Acknowledge, acknowledge his his deliverance. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to bear it. Do you, do you see this? Acknowledge his deliverance. We're running out of time. Let us next how to forgive. For if you forgive others, their, verse 14, if you forgive others their offenses, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But if you don't forgive others, your father will not forgive your offenses. How, 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 do, how do we forgive? Well, for the believer, can I, just, can I just say for the believer, forgiveness is required for those who have been forgiven. And so how do we do it? Because man, I haven't met one person that's never been hurt or wronged by somebody. It's a broken, sad, sinful state of a world that we live in. And so how do we as the church forgive people? Listen, you forgive people by faith. Ephesians 4.32 says, And be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another just as God also forgave you in Christ. The, the moment we pause and consider, no, nah, that person doesn't deserve my forgiveness. We must consider that you and I did not deserve to be forgiven. But we are forgiven people. We are forgiven people empowered by the living God to forgive others. Who has hurt you? Who has harmed you? As a believer in Christ Jesus, there is no other way. Forgive in faith. And be set free. Jesus has much to say about forgiveness. We see it in Matthew 5. We see it in Matthew 9. We see it right here in chapter 6. We see it in chapter 18. Jesus has much to say about forgiveness. But here the emphasis is on the fact that it is not an option. Now, lastly, how to fast. As we prepare for lunch, Mama's Day lunch, here we go. Whenever, verse 16, whenever you fast, don't be gloomy like the hypocrites. We see it again. For they will make their faces unattractive so that their fasting is obvious to people. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that your fasting isn't obvious to others. But to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. The hypocritical religious leaders of the day as they took part in the fasting, which, by the way, according to Luke chapter 18, verse 12, it was twice a week. The, the Pharisees and scribes twice a week, Luke 18, 12, uh, says that uh, they would fast. And so when they would fast, they, they wanted everyone to know how hard it was, how hard it was, how difficult. Anyone that's fasted, by the way, you know how hard it is. And, and so they wanted everyone to know, though. And Jesus says, no, there's a better way. Don't let anybody know. You go about your business. What is fasting? Fasting is giving up something uh, physical for, 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 the, for something spiritual. God, I want to encounter you. God, I want to hear from you. You got a major decision. Go, go to the Lord in prayer and take time to fast. What is fasting? It's, fasting is all about sacrifice. We're going to talk much more about fasting as we, as we continue through preaching through the, the, the gospel. But the, the question as we close today is this. Which of these how-tos needs the most attention in your life? Listen, I don't want to be the one to say it's this one, that one. I don't know. But in a moment, we're going to get alone with the Lord, and we're going to have a time to respond to him. And I want to encourage you, respond honestly, because we've seen. He sees all things. He's over all things. child who needs the most attention. See, the, the real problem, listen, the real problem with the hypocrite, the real problem 
with the hypocrite is self-interest. It's all about me, my wants, my needs, me, me, me. How generous I am, how eloquent my speech is, how religious I am, how good I look. That's the real problem with the hypocritical religious leaders. But Jesus teaches us a better way to live. Jesus teaches us a better way to live. If we're, if we're really going to experience this better way, then listen, the focus of this life must, it must shift from me to him. If we're really going to live this way, we're really going to encounter the Lord in all his glory and others encounter his glory in us, then the focus has to shift, church, from me to him. At the burning bush, when Moses said, what is your name? God said, I am. I am is my name. I am that I am. I'm existent, self-existent. No one created me. No one sustains me. I just am. I am always have been I always will be that's who I am and I want to remind us remind us today church that he is Jehovah Jireh the Lord our provider he is Jehovah Rapha the Lord our healer he is Jehovah Nisi the Lord our banner he is Jehovah Shalom the Lord our peace he is Jehovah Ra the Lord our shepherd. He is Jehovah Sekinu, the Lord our righteousness. And he is Jehovah Shema. The Lord is here. Jesus teaches us a better way to live. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? All across this place, those online with us, would you take a moment, say, Lord, what is my response from all of this? What is my response from all of this? What do you want me to do with this? What needs to change in me? We're going to sing this song, and as we sing this song, there's going to be men and women that would love to pray with you. If you're in the house today, there's going to be men and women at the different corners of this room that would love to pray with you. And if you're online with us, you might feel alone. You might be sitting in a room all alone. But the Lord, our God, is He's there. And there's a host online that would love to come alongside of you in prayer as well. Whatever your need is today, would you be honest before the Lord? As people are praying that, would you just pray that simple prayer? God, what is my response today? What is my response? And I tell you, our greatest need, our greatest need is salvation. That's our greatest need. That's the starting point. That's our greatest need. That's your greatest need. If you've never reached out and received the free gift of salvation, the Bible tells us to call upon the name of the Lord and we will be saved. You will be saved. The Bible says to believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. Today, would you acknowledge that you're a sinner, that you've missed it, that you've sinned, and that Jesus Christ alone is the Savior? Would you acknowledge that from your heart to, to the Lord, from, from your lips? Would you acknowledge that? And would you commit to following him all the days of your life?